Hello, and welcome to the Connected Community Podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Sri Shukla, and we dive on into the ancient and beautiful system of Ayurveda, or Ayurveda. Sri really walks us down this path of the history of this ancient system, where it came from, how it became popularized in the United States, how it's a very integrative system. So it looks at the complete picture of the mind, the body, and the spirit. There's internal practices, the things that we put inside our body. So the supplements and the herbs and food, but also meditation and chanting. And then there's those external therapies, which is the oil, the massage, exercise, and things like that. We break down the three doshas and their, all their attributes and how balancing them is so important. So this is really a great episode and just really diving into the basics of this ancient practice. I really hope you'll enjoy this episode. Please give us a like, a share, and a subscribe. And I want to thank you so much for being here today. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the Connected Community Podcast, a place to explore possibility through mindfulness, movement, and self-discovery. Our intention is to deliver insight and inspiration while fostering conversations that are genuine, unfiltered, and deeply human. We hope you will enjoy today's episode. Hi, Shri. I want to thank you so much for coming on to the Connected Community Podcast today. Thank you so much for having me here, Nikki, with you. Yeah, I'm excited. So we're, today we're going to talk about Ayurveda, and um, I love this topic. So I'm just curious if we could just give a brief overview of what Ayurveda is for somebody that's never heard that word before. Sure, yeah. So the, the word Ayurveda, it means... Um, Ayur means life or um, longevity, and Veda means knowledge or science. So Ayurveda literally means the science or the knowledge of longevity. Oh, That's okay. the exact meaning. Yeah. And now Ayurveda is the anglicized pronunciation of it. So I, I will stick with, the, uh, with Ayurveda as the original. And um, it's both a philosophical system but it's also an integrative system in the sense that it looks at the whole mind, body, spirit integration. The, the core philosophy of Ayurveda is that there are five big elements uh, on this earth, which is ether. Ether is the space. Think of it as like very um, open, spacious, something that you would, you would find maybe like up in the space when the rockets go there. And then there mm -hmm. is air, which is lower and uh, fire, water, and earth. So these are the five big elements that every all matter is made up of. And these elements also exist within our body. So we as microcosms are just reflections of the macrocosm and the cosmos. And this is where we get our oneness in nature from. So this is the big philosophy of Ayurveda. And Ayurveda has origins in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, I think it, uh, it became popular for two reasons in the United States. One is because of the yoga and the other is um, transcendental meditation brought about by Maharishi Yogi in uh, the 1970s and 80s. There's also been a lot of immigration of physicians, Indian physicians, and I think that created a culture where we began to understand Ayurveda for its uh, uh, for the big philosophy on longevity and how we can include it in our lives. And how old is the system? Yeah, uh, so it's not exact to say. Uh, it could be traced back anywhere to 5,000 to 3,000 years back. Some traditions say it was an or it was initially an oral tradition before it began to be documented, and um, really there are thousands and thousands of books on Ayurveda. Uh, it, so it's a very large uh, science, but also there is like uh, all kinds of therapies which are both inner therapies and outer therapies. So the inner therapies tend to be um, like meditation or chanting mantras and. Um, Food can be like seen as an inner and outer therapy. Inner herbs are outer. And the whole technique of doing massages and abhyanga or oil therapies on the body. So there's a huge combination of inner and outer in, in Ayurveda. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so you have a doctorate in our PhD in health social work. Um, yeah. from Rutgers, which is an awesome university. So let's talk about how you kind of fell into Ayurved and how that um, path has unfolded for you. So because uh, I have been a health professional for the longest time, for more than over 15 years, uh, and uh, then I had a health crisis myself mm -hmm. in my early 30s. I was announced, pronounced to be like completely well. And I was told that I could go back home and do everything I wanted, live a normal life. But I, that was not my experience. There were all these loose ends that I was experiencing. And I looked perfectly fine on the outside. So I couldn't really go and tell people what I'm yeah. experiencing on the inside because there was like, um, like fatigue and exhaustion and like, just things that I couldn't fully explain and neither could my physicians. And I had a team of six, seven physicians at some time. And none of them, I, I really would try to talk to them about stress. Like how is stress impacting me? And how was that the root cause? Could that be the root cause of my uh, sudden crash and illness? And um, I didn't really get any responses. Ayurveda was always around me because I do come from India, but the, we kind of, can zoom out of things when they're over familiar. Mm. And so I went back into a more studied process of how Ayurveda could be useful for me. And, um, it started really with this quiz of like the dosha quiz, just the concept of having these five elements within us, it makes started to make like intuitive sense. And there is, of course, the whole listening to our bodies, but because every body is unique and um, everybody has a certain elemental composition, which is the dosha, and dosha literally means something that could go out of balance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, there are three big doshas. There's the vata, which is the wind and the airy element, the pitta, which is the heat or the fire element, and the kapha, which is made up of water and earth. Yep. So these elements exist everywhere around us in nature, but in our bodies, they exist a little differently. For example, the upper body tends to be more kapha predominant. So we have more the, the mucus lining, the synovial joints. These are, these are more water and earth kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, textures. They are more smooth. They are more supportive. They give structure to our bodies. And then the middle part of our bodies tends to be more pitta, where the pitta is responsible for digestion, for metabolism, um, all kinds of transformative work that our bodies do with food and how they uh, eliminate toxins. And then there is the vata, which is the lowest part of our, our body. All the elements exist in all our organs in different proportions to a different extent, but this is very broadly speaking in the human body as well. And so when I started to learn about these things, I realized it can actually help me on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with what I do at home. And mm -hmm. uh, I started to see that there is a sense of empowerment that I got from actually applying parts of it in my life. And um, that's what I teach along with other, like using social work as a background as well. Yeah. Let's talk about the three doshas because I think um, that will help people understand um, the system a lot better. And that's kind of how I fell into Ayurveda a long time ago too, was looking at the doshas and figuring out my dosha. And um, and just like yeah. a broad overview is what I think of when I think of somebody that's vata, they're kind of running around and they have lots of energy. And then I think of everything dryness, they like dry foods and their skin's dry and their hair's dry and mm -hmm. like everything's just dry. And then I think of Petta as that fire, that fire energy, that feistiness. And then, um, and then looking at somebody that's Pitta, they might have that mm -hmm. red skin or those rashes and those breakouts. And, um, mm -hmm. and then Kapha I always think of as like slow and steady and they like those comfort foods and those warm, maybe sweet foods and they move a little bit slower. Um, and I know that's like a super broad generalization, but let's break down the doshas yeah. because I think understanding the doshas helps us understand wh which dosha is ours. And then if it's out of balance, how we can get that back into balance with diet and yeah. exercise and meditation and all these things. So 
Um, let's go yeah. a little bit deeper into those three doshas, explaining them and how they appear in, in our bodies. Sure. Yeah. So before we understand the dosha, we must understand what prakriti or the basic constitution really means. So the basic constitution is a sort of static part of our physical and mental and emotional composition. And when we do the Vata, Pitta, Kapha analysis, and we try to understand what is the ratio of these elements in our body, in the most ideal situation, the VPK is a representation of what kind of genetic codes got locked in at the time of conception. So this is a sort of inheritance from both the mother and the father. Now, when we say the Vata, Pitta, Kapha, like whatever the ratio is for every individual, it's important to remember that even though the mental and emotional part is, it is a very variable. So it keeps varying according to all kinds of exposure and socialization that we have in life, which is why it is possible for somebody who grew up um, with a lot of love to still experience um, trauma and then to become mentally different from what their VPK locking in was at the time of birth and while they were growing up. So this is not that static. So um, that is, those are the mental and emotional qualities of the mind. And that's called rajas, which is a more action-oriented element. And it, it corresponds a bit to pitta and fire. And then there is sattva, which is, corresponds a little more to um, water and earth elements. Sattva is the purity of mind. Rajas is the action, our, our will, our determination, our ambition. And then there is tamas. Tamas has this very dark, heavy, lethargic qualities to it. So when I would do an analysis with somebody or I'm trying to understand their prakriti, the prakriti is, uh, uh, is all of this. And I want to understand who they initially were, who they were meant to be in nature, but yeah. also what all these ex life experiences are and how they've affected them. Right, right. That makes sense. So you're not just looking at what's presenting in that moment because they could be running around like with a chicken, like with their head cut off and that would appear as vata, but that could be something that's happened in their life or conditioning that's mapped into them over time. And so that might yeah. not be their original dosha. Is that what you're saying? So when I do the quiz with an individual, when they are not looking at who they could be or who they want to be, and when we are really coming from a very straightforward place mm -hmm. of what really resonates with us, sometimes there are also like physical features which align with the vata, pitta, kapha, right. right? So the kapha people actually could have rounder faces and they could have bigger eyes and they could have a sweet speech. And these are said to be um, physical traits of kapha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And kapha is also the element that increases in the body, right? So overweight is a kapha trait. And so the kapha person has to really work harder than the vata and the pitta person to, yeah. to address those concerns. And while the vata person can also have uh, an, an issue with being overweight, they will probably have an easier time coming back to balance because that's not the natural prakriti. Okay, right. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. yes. So we are actually living in a very vata predominant world right now yeah. because all this all the communication that we have the technology the airplanes flying from one place to another this is all transportation movement and so we are living in times of like very high activity yeah. and this really affects us which um, it also affects the mind and so very often all depression and anxiety is not vata related but anxiety particularly is a vata issue yeah. at its core uh, that but but the point is like we we really have uh, these external forces constantly yeah. interacting with with our profiles yeah with our blueprints yeah so if I think of Vata energy, I think of planes and trains and automobiles and everything moving around and social media and things changing and flipping really quickly. And then Kapha would be, you know, being in a meadow and a stream doing a meditative practice. 
Um, and then would Pitta be yeah. like this fiery anger? Would the, like would anger be wrapped up into Pitta, like a that fiery, passionate energy? Yeah. So all of these qualities, the Vata, the Pitta, the Kapha, they have an upside and they have a downside as well. Yeah. So Pitta is good. Pitta is actually bright. It's intelligent. It's great ideas. It's great leadership. This is mm. what good quality pitta is yeah now when pitta deteriorates and it goes and in, it goes into its lower form then it can show up as anger as frustration as something that's that's dark and negative and this is also true for the kapha and vata dosha so like good kapha is literally like bright it's really beautiful it's the life force energy like how all the different organs come together and how the hormones function together that's the integrity of the body the vata it also has its upsides it's creative it's expansive it's like good air wind blowing through our faces like making us feel cool and really beautiful and um uh, expansive but then vata also has this downside of uh, uh, like dryness and um, irritation and weakness in the body and um, like frailty is like vata and yeah. so um, we also personally go through these upsides and downsides. That's something to remember. Yeah, yeah. That's an emotional component as well. So Kapha, for example, uh, has all these leadership qualities and this like amazing glow about them, but they, they can also be possessive emotionally. They can be hoarders of things and uh, of ideas or emotional hoarding in the body can happen for Kapha people. Okay, yeah. So the most, most important thing would be just to get them to figure out what our dosha is, I think sounds like step one, and then working to balance the dosha. And what I find so fascinating is um, I have a lot of pitta vata. I don't have a lot of kapha. Um, and, and vata is that, you know, that whirlwind energy, that dryness. And then what happens is the foods that I'm attracted to are salty, crunchy things, which is exactly the foods that are not great for vata. Um, yeah. where for me, it seems like to balance it, I would need more of the kapha foods, but I'm not attracted to the kapha foods, which are those yeah. like warm soups and nurturing things. Right. And, and maybe even like dairy and the heavier foods. Um, mm. and so why is it that we're attracted to what is not best for us? <laughs> yeah. It's the simple principle of like attracts like. There is an elemental pull in the body towards certain things. That's mm -hmm. the that's the simple answer. But again, rem let's remember we are not just the body; we are also our minds, and um, we are literally buddhi. Buddhi is the term for individualized intelligence in the human being, and so we use this mm -hmm. to bring the doshas back to balance. We use our buddhi. Yeah, yeah. So what are some ways that we can get ourselves back into balance? The biggest thing with Ayurveda is, is having um, routines and organizing our day in tune with the rhythms of nature. So, uh, Ayurveda tells us that the morning time, like 6 a.m. to roughly 10 a.m. is the kapha time of the day. And then 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. is the pitta time of the day. And two to six is the vata time of the day. And then the cycle repeats itself. You can, you must try to eat your, the heaviest meal of the day during um, the pitta time between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And that's when your digestion is at mm -hmm. fire. That's when you are likely to absorb your food really well. And so eating warm cooked foods is another mm -hmm. uh, a basic principle in Ayurveda and the other thing is cortisol rises early in the morning and that's the time you want to get some exercise and some movement in and then our melatonin uh, is kicking in during the night time and that's when you start to prepare to go to bed and if you don't prepare to go to bed between like 9 and 10 then the um, cortisol again starts kicking in and you have difficulty going back to sleep so like just following these basic rhythms of how nature has uh, planned for our day is really helpful. The other way, like as an example, is that uh, there's something called Tanmatra Chikitsa in Ayurveda, which is like literally using our five senses 
which is sight, smell, taste, touch, and sound, to um, to actually like use these five senses to organize uh, different parts of our day. And so, like in the morning when um, the sun is like bright, and you might want to like use your senses to listen to brighter feeling music and maybe a little louder mm -hmm. and like when you wind down during the day you actually uh, listen to something that's more calming and soothing that's one of the the things that come up in our week is like you do your mantras in the morning if you do your chanting but your meditation you do it in the evening or mm -hmm. at the night okay so are you saying that no matter what dosha we are that everyone should follow that cycle of like waking up having the most energy then eating the lighter meals then listening to the lighter music and then as the evening goes on then we're having the the heavier foods and then the quieter times and in the meditation practice no matter what dosha we're in so there are some human things which are over and above doshas so, for example, what we now famously called intermittent fasting, uh, in our way, like a 12 hour fast is for everybody. Right. Okay. So we, we, eat, we eat our dinner at 8 p.m. and then we eat breakfast at 8 a.m. in the morning. Like it's for everybody, regardless of dosha. And mm. yes, an early bedtime and an early dinner is good for everybody, regardless of dosha, right. because there are doshas working inside the body. The, the intestine has certain doshas, the, the gut has certain doshas working within it. So like, it's not just your structure and the, like the basic VPK profile, right. but it's like, it's the more subtle uh, things that are going on inside the body, which are already in tune with, with the cycles of nature. And all we are doing here is just um, aligning them with mm -hmm. the rhythms of nature. That's all we're doing. Right. What about yeah. when we're living in an environment that isn't complementary to our dosha? So I think I'm vata, I'm pitta yeah. vata. I'm, it's a it's a toss up, but I think I'm vata. Um, and yet I'm living in Colorado, which is a very cold, dry climate, yeah. which would not be yeah. in my best interest. I'd probably do better in like a warmer, more humid climate. And so mm. when we're not in an environment that complements the dosha that we're in then how mm -hmm. do we compensate to fix or correct that? Yes. So before I mention that, I do have to mention that there's also global warming going on, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So like, even if it's, it's supposed to be spring or, but it's um, really, really like winter outside and that's an effect of global warming, then I'm not going to start behaving like it's spring. And I'm not going to start eating or making my day according to spring. I will still do it according to what the weather is actually looking like outside, which is winter. Yeah. That's one thing to remember. The other thing is if you're really living, if it's, if it's not, which is often the case, right? We live our lives um, just according to so many other parameters. And so like a lot of daily abhyanga and using oils is going to be excellent for you. Mm -hmm. But if somebody is uh, living in a cold place and as we get older, the vata also increases in our bodies. So like doing more full, full body abhyangas, full body oil massages with the right kinds of oils that you that that are compatible for your skin and that you actually start to enjoy and including more um, even essential oils so that they can like light up your senses a little more. Uh, that's going to be really helpful apart yeah. from eating a more a, a warmer diet. Yeah. yeah, but abhyanga is really good for everybody. The colder the place, and the more vata constitution the individual, the more this oil uh, oiling procedures can be very very helpful to you. Yeah, yeah, and you will actually start to enjoy that. Like I'm very kapha, but even then, like I can use mini abhyangas, and I can use like coconut oil or more cooling oils on my body because we're all as we're getting older we actually need more of that uh, warmth and the, the what the oils can actually do for us it's also mm -hmm. great for us mentally yeah what oils are good for um for vata if you said coconut oil is good for kapha you can start with sesame oil organic sesame oil mm -hmm. that's yeah. so thick it's it's <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting hmm. so you might actually like um, feel uncomfortable like you just said it's so thick but once you like experience how it feels on your body yeah. and uh, 
you see the texture of your skin improve, you might actually start to like it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So this is, so this is cool. We can change how balanced we are by, um, by oils, by our environment, by the foods. Let's talk about a little bit of the foods for the different doshas that are best. Mm. Yeah. So food is, see the number one thing, this is, this is probably didn't exist when Ayurveda was created, but it exists now. And this is um, part of the work of the modern um, Ayurvedic uh, holistic health coach, which is processed foods, foods which are genetically modified, um, over refrigerated foods, everything that you find like in the inner aisles is yeah. really, it is a problem. It is actually food which is tamasic in nature it, mm -hmm. as per Ayurveda. So that's the top layer that we have to really work on. We don't rejuvenate the body without actually cleaning the body internally. Yeah. And as long as we can, we are consuming all these foods which are like overly processed and genetically modified and there's like uh, too much sugar, too much salt. This is all going on. That's why I say like Ayurveda is so sophisticated because like when we take away this top layer, then we get to what's correct for your dosha and what's correct to bring you to back to balance. Yeah, that makes sense. Right? Yeah. In general, it is tricky, and that's why you, that's why people like me exist to support others. Even I find it difficult sometimes. So, like I am kaffa, so dairy should ideally not be overconsumed by kaffa people. Dairy just has qualities which exaggerate kaffa is within our bodies, mm -hmm. and so like lessening the dairy content is really helpful. But at the same time, dairy for a non-vegetarian person, somebody who doesn't consume too, too much meat. Uh, dairy becomes a source of bala or strength, which is protein in yeah. the body. So yeah. we need to have protein. Like protein is really essential. It's a sort of source of strength, especially for for everybody. But that's one example of like how food tends to work. Mm -hmm. So would I be correct or incorrect in thinking that somebody that has a lot of pitta, a lot of fire, would not want that heavy red meat? That that would not be in alignment? So. If there is a pitta imbalance, we might want to reduce the intake of red meat. This is about making choices because yeah. the balance happens one step at a time. It doesn't happen all at once. So, for example, most spices are uh, vata kapha pacifying. And spices are also uh, very much recommended in our cooking and in our daily uses, uh, use in Ayurveda. But for a person who's pitta aggravated and they have all these uh, digestive issues and um, IBS or like a range of digestive health problems, you might want to actually reduce the spices and uh, maybe give them like some cooling spices like fennel. Yeah. Yeah. Mint. Yeah. Something that's more mm -hmm. cooling. Pitta people will typically want spicy food. Yeah. They, they will like it and they will want it. So, yeah. 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 Um. So we've already talked about like our diet and our physical environment. Um, then what about supplements in the system? In Ayurveda, we use natural herbs. This is plant-based medicine. When we use the herbs, they are giving us their, uh, their life force energy and they're lending our prana or that vital energy to us so that we can come back to balance herbs there are the tridoshic ones there are those which are used to balance vata or kapha or pitta and it's so important the way herbs are being used these days it's like people consume them as if it's um, uh, it's it's a solution for every problem mm -hmm. which it is not so it's really important to understand that uh, for example ashwagandha ashwagandha is such a popular herb and the problem is that um, overconsumption of ashwagandha, even though it is vata and kapha pacifying, and we live in a vata world, so it makes a lot of sense to consume ashwagandha. But the problem is that overconsumption, without doing making all the other changes, it actually leads to more ama creation in the body. Yeah. And ama is uh, undigested food, literally. But ama is also anything that's unprocessed within the body. Right. And ama it can also be unprocessed emotion. Mm. And it can be toxic emotion. Herbs are really sophisticated. It becomes very hard for the herb to actually do its work and to produce the results that we are looking for uh, while we are like, 
consuming uh, processed foods and alcohol and everything else and then expect the herbs to work uh, yeah. it's not going to have the same effect i don't per se recommend that people consume a lot of herbs without knowing what their state of balance is what their state of imbalance is do they like truly need that herb yeah our body is an inner pharmacy it's doing a lot of things on its own it doesn't always need all these external inputs although in many conditions they are correct but uh, it's like trying not to be our own physician all the time you know yeah. and um in ayurveda do they touch on the emotional and the mind body connection oh yes i mean ayurveda is all about the mind body connection right so like i mentioned before ojas is like the integrity so there's three basic things like there's ojas which is like the earth and water of kapha and then yeah. there is tejas which is like the pitta and the fire and then there is prana prana and prana is like the water or the airy energy so ojas is really responsible for the integrity of the body like bringing or bringing all our organs together and the hormones together and uh, tejas is actually what provides direction what should go where mm-hmm. so you know like when you say oh you're on the perfect diet but um, it's it's still not working that's because the tejas is not working it's not reaching the right channels the you eating everything healthy but it's not really absorbing so that's the fine tejas and then there is prana prana is really responsible for our breath but also for how all our senses come together and prana is so important prana is really like the vata airy element but uh, it's very very subtle inside the body um, it's it's really our connection to life force vitality yeah we can do all of these therapies and uh, we can give the person like oils and herbs and correct their diet and their routines and everything and so the person is not improving and that's that happens when the prana is really depleted and so what what kind of things deplete prana is really like external things like um, uh, a person is um, being insulted by his boss in the office every day and they are not able to like cope with this really well and that uh, that insult on a daily basis is really depleting their prana it's the same with like trauma or grief and all of these situations can really deplete us completely no matter how many external corrections we do which is where my role as a social worker also becomes important because i am able to bring in tools and ways of thinking and um like sort of reframing the mental aspects along with these uh, ayurvedic therapies to to help the person uh, be one step ahead in the healing process yeah and another way that ayurveda uh, looks at the mind body system is through the chakra system so we understand that there are like seven basic chakras uh, mm-hmm. right from the root chakra to our ajna and uh, the sahasrasam and uh, all of these chakras are really connected with different uh, organs of the body and the endocrine systems but they're also connected with these like emotional desires that human beings have right from the root of like having security and rootedness to having joy and purpose yeah. and so uh, we look at all of this in a very integrative uh, integrative way and we try to understand like if an organ is not functioning properly then it's likely that that chakra is also affected yeah. and that the the corresponding parts of uh, of what that chakra represents and means are also hurt or are okay. also d- negatively affected yeah 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 i just released a podcast about um the chakras so um and i'm taking a course in it so i understand exactly what you're saying is is that if um if there's a physical ailment then we can connect that to what part of the body and then what part of the chakra and sometimes it's healing that chakra um yeah. or that wound that that inner wound that will help us heal from the inside out. Yeah. 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 And then I think um let's talk about physical activity because I imagine a vata person's wanting to run 
and the kapha person's wanting to do restorative yoga, but they should really switch roles and, and do, do the opposite. Um, again, we're attracted to the things that aren't necessarily the best for us. So let's talk about yeah. the best exercises for the different doshas, assuming that everything else is balanced out properly. Okay. Okay. So, um, I mean, the kapha person can really, they don't like to work out at all. But they should, they are really open to all kinds of uh, exercise, right? From uh, uh, walking to doing strength training and uh, different kinds of yoga. And the kapha person might actually be a good candidate for um, um, hot yoga. They might be a good candidate depending on what else is going on with them. And uh, so the vata person likes to run and they make good runners. But the thing is like their joints uh, are sometimes a little bit uh, mm -hmm. more fragile as compared to some like the kapha, kapha people. And mm -hmm. um, well, they're drier, so, right? I and mean, there's not as much lubrication. Things don't run as smoothly because everything's a little drier. Right, right. Um, so more grounding exercises would be great. Like yoga, yogic postures, which are actually more grounding. Mm -hmm. And also the process of like just, um, I think it's called grounding in the modern, like yeah. some alternative. Yeah, but like actually just sitting on the grass and being connected with nature and actually making connection with soil and earth and yeah. gardens and agricultural fields, like that's really good for uh, mm -hmm. the, the water person. Like this is only again like talking so broadly and like we can't really compartmentalize the world into three big yeah. Types. And yeah, yeah, so it's really important that I say that again and again so that people understand that uh, it's not a prescription. And then, like for the pitta person, certain types of yoga would be really nice. Uh, uh, a typical pitta person would be slim, uh, would want to be ha to have more flexibility, which a vata person also has. And just the cooling environment is an important piece, you know. When I see very, very thin, skinny people running out in the heat, I feel concerned for them because they're, they're actually aggravating their doshas by running around out in the heat at like 12 noon or 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Yeah. And so like just that interaction is uh, important for the typical Vata Pitta profile. Like what conditions are you working out in? Like that's that's an important piece. Yeah, yeah. What are some misconceptions that you find um, around Ayurveda and how do you address those? One is that Ayurveda is all about vegetarianism, which it is not. Meat mm. is certainly permitted in Ayurveda. The guideline is that we first consume plants and we first consume what was initially made for us. So meat is not the first go-to. Yeah. In fact, it's used widely in all kinds of Ayurvedic medicines. So it's not that Ayurveda is all about vegetarianism or veganism. That's one thing. Yeah. The other thing is people think that sometimes that uh, herbs are placebos and they only have a placebo effect. I think uh, that plant medicine actually has energy and energetic compositions which are directly borrowed from the plants. And different foods have different effects on our body and we feel them. We can yeah. feel them uh, in very direct ways within half an hour or one hour. But uh, herbs are much more subtle and so they need um, a certain environment in the body to function really well. And when we provide them that environment, we will see the efficacy of the herbs uh, really well. Right. So and that's, I... that, that's too, yeah, yeah. And sometimes people think that it's uh, very religious. Uh, Ayurveda exists everywhere in the world where the five elements exist. So as long as the five elements are there, which is everywhere around us, really Ayurveda exists. When it's the science of healing and it's the science of longevity, it belong belongs to all mankind. Yeah. And so, so that perception of it being as anything like particularly religious or belonging only to India, I would really love to completely deflate that idea. Yeah. How widely is it practiced in India in this current time? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Ayurveda is uh, used in people's homes without fully understanding the system sometimes. Uh, we definitely use um, a lot of herbs, like spices, for example, are used in most Indian cooking and most Indian homes. But where the herbs and the medicines are concerned, I feel like uh, 
we might be a little bit over dependent on consuming them when the body can use its own corrective mechanisms first. Yeah. 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 It's such a huge, vast, complex system. And I know we like to simplify it down to like the three doshas and we take the test and then we try to go from there. But I, I hear that it's a, it's a big, huge, vast system. And it is important that someone, um, is identified in the right dosha and that they have somebody helping them along the path until they are competent on their own. Um, so what yeah. are some of the things that you offer and how can people reach you? Yeah, so currently I am uh, doing pregnancy preparation and fertility support for women who desire to have children naturally and uh, they desire to have keep their body strong and healthy through the preconception um, journey and the pregnancy and postpartum. That's one area uh, that I'm specializing in and helping people with. And the other is uh, I have a body-based mental health program. So it is really emerging from the belief that making uh, corrections uh, and supporting the body physically also has effects for the mind and the spirit. And so like this is another area that I'm currently assisting people with. Yeah. And how do people find you if they want to connect with you? So the easiest way to do it is through um, Instagram. Uh, my Instagram handle is uh, Viva by Shri. Mm -hmm. And then I have a website. It's um, Viva by Shri dot Cohere dot live. And, and I'll put those uh, in, the, in the links yeah. in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise. I'm, I was really excited to interview you today and I appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Connected Community Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share, and subscribe. I can be found at www.nikiyyoga.com, N-I-C-K-Y yyoga.com. Until I see you again next week, I hope you have a beautiful day.